So tonight's topic is your two-stroke engine about to fail. And joining us is uh, Brian Carpenter of Rainbow Aviation. And uh, Brian is uh, no stranger to uh, EIA members. He's uh, He's been a Quicksilver dealer for 25 years, designed and built his own airplane. He's a CFI and sport pilot examiner, a Rotax instructor, an A&P mechanic with the IA, and uh, much more. And, and Brian, I would like to uh, turn things over to you and, and uh, let you uh, start into your presentation for this evening on two-stroke engines. Brian? Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, um, we have did this one before. I think the last time that we did this presentation we had a little technical difficulty, so hopefully this one will go a little bit better, give uh, some of you guys a chance to um, get some additional information. This, this topic here, and can you hear me okay, Steve? Is this coming through okay now? Yep, so far so good on this end. Okay, good. Just wanted to double check there. So, um, we talked before, and one of the challenges that we always have with this presentation, of course, is um, getting enough time to cover all the material. And we're not going to be able to cover everything about your two-stroke engine, obviously, in this um, webinar. But we're going to give you some real good ideas, and we're going to hit some of the highlights on why these two-stroke engines are failing and what's actually what's actually going on with those. Before we start, I just want to do a little self-introduction here. I am Brian Carpenter with Rainbow Aviation Services. Uh, we operate out of Corning, California, and we just got back from um, spending the entire month of September out at EAA headquarters teaching our 120-hour maintenance course that we do for the light sport community out there. And so a little of my background, uh, like Steve said, I've been an AMPIA for over 30 years now. I'm a DAR for amateur built light sport and, um, and um, uh, experimental light sport aircraft. I've been involved with the EAA for well, as far as I can remember my entire life, I've been a tech counselor and flight advisor, and I still, um, on a regular basis, do a lot of test flights for um, people in our surrounding area, and I'm also a flight instructor with an instrument rating, uh, sport pilot examiner and instructor examiner, and back in the ultralight days, I was an ultralight instructor, um, and now have a little over 8,000 hours and over 30 different aircraft, and I've designed and built quite a few, um, or I've built quite a few airplanes, and I've designed my own aircraft. Here's just a couple of uh, the aircraft that I've built myself and uh, flown over the years. This aircraft that we're seeing on the screen right now is actually um, the um, Ranger aircraft, which I built. Uh, it's actually about uh, 15 years old now, and it's got quite a few hours on it. We basically use it for. Um, our maintenance classes now. Since it's an open type aircraft, we have easy access to it, so we use it quite a bit for that. Um, Carol and I were winners of the 2007 Moody Award for Excellence in Ultralight and Light Sport Aviation, and we were really proud to have uh, won that uh, award. It was really important aspect in our in our career. We're also authors of uh, two books: one called The Professional Approach to Ultralights, and another one called Sport Pilot Airplane. And we wrote these. Um, 2004 and 2005, and um, I think they're now, well, one of them's in their third printing, and uh, uh, I think the Sport Pilot book is in its second printing right now. Um, we're also the teachers for the Light Sport Repairman courses, and uh, we do that both in California and at EA headquarters once a year. So, on to the topic at hand here. Um, is your two-stroke engine about to fail? Um, I think before we start this, let's do, Steve, let's do a, um, a survey on which two-stroke engines you, um, you own. And I've, I've kind of made a little graph there, but let's look and see what you guys end up with. I'm just guessing at what it's actually going to be here. All right. For uh, those who will uh, just take a moment, just go ahead and click on one, select the, the engine that, uh, that you're using, and we'll tally up the votes here in uh, just a moment. And right now, uh, about 70% of you have voted, so we'll give folks a chance to grab their mouse and, uh, and make a selection. This was really interesting last time that we did this. Um, I had just taken a wild stab at the ratios uh, and made up the graph myself, and we'll see how those compare out there. And it'll also give me an idea to the audience that I'm speaking to tonight and what kind of equipment you guys are actually operating. All right, just a couple more seconds here to give you to uh, vote. We'll go on, go ahead and close out the poll. So uh, we'll do that in just a few seconds here. A couple more folks are voting. And let's go ahead and close it and uh, show you the results. And it looks like the Rotax is about 86% of our audience uh, this, tonight, and 8% uh, say something, some other uh, type of engine. 
Wow. Yeah, that's that's actually pretty close to the um, to the graph that I drew there. Um, this is pretty typical for what we see out there. Um, Rotax has always been um, putting its efforts out into the um, out in to the industry in such a significant way that they've managed to capture market share and um, I was guessing at 80 percent Rotax and I, in, in this group we have here we're actually about 87 percent so um, not uncommon at all so at least I know to the when I speak tonight um, because of this ratio that we're talking about here um, my topic will be uh, generic enough that it'll apply to other types of aircraft but I'm going to be speaking specifically Rotax so um, there may be some differences. Now, the next survey I want to do here is how many hours do you have flying uh, with a two-stroke engine? And we'll just get a kind of an idea of what you guys are actually operating out there and see how many hours you've got flying two strokes. And this is really helpful also to validate um, the failure modes. And I'll kind of explain that after you get going here. All right, right. Uh, about 85% uh, have voted so far. Everybody's got their mouse handy this time. And just give you a few more uh, seconds to go ahead and click. Um, yeah, we're just about 100% now, so let's go ahead and uh, close out that poll and share the results with you. Looks like uh, less than 100 is our, our leader. About 38% have less than um, 100 hours. Uh, 100 to uh, 400 hours, 29%. 28% uh, have no time so far. And 6% uh, are uh, long timers with over 400 hours uh, with two-stroke engines. Okay, very good. Yeah, this is, um, this is good, too. This will help us when we start talking about um, um, this whole presentation here. But one of the things you will see is... When we do these surveys around the country, and we've taught over 2,000 students now in our classes that uh, we teach, and so we, get a, we do these surveys on a pretty regular basis with every class and kind of get an idea. And uh, we usually hold anybody that has more than uh, 200 hours of flight time behind a two-stroke. Typically, we've had at least one or two engine failures from uh, those individuals. And so the objective of, of this uh, presentation, of course, is uh, to keep this from becoming, well, um, looking something a little bit more along the lines of this picture here. And this is not all that uncommon. The problem with a two-stroke engine failure is not that the engine failure is a big deal, but, um, you know, we could fix a two-stroke engine pretty good, but we don't want the cost that goes along if we don't do a good landing or something like this. So now that we've kind of got an idea of who we've got out there and how many hours you guys have got, let's take and um, answer the question whether or not you've actually had a true stroke engine failure. All right, you know the drill by now, and it's a pretty simple question. Have you ever had a two stroke engine failure in flight, yes or no? And uh, quickly up to uh, the, the top of the percentage board right now, 95% uh, have voted, so a few more seconds if you want to get in on this, but I think the uh, results are pretty conclusive here. We'll share those with you. Uh, no, 74% of our, our viewers and listeners uh, tonight have not experienced a two-stroke engine failure in flight. However, 26% have. And that, that would stand pretty close to what we typically see on the ratio of how many guys had over 200 hours. Um, that's not uncommon. That's really, in today's environment, really not an acceptable uh, number to be having out there. And we're going to talk tonight, we're going to try and get you to the point where you don't actually um, need to experience an engine failure. We have come so far over the years. Um, in the early years of flying, there were so many failures that it was just, um, it, it was actually kind of considered a normal occurrence. I remember going on cross-country flights with uh, five or six people on a weekend, and there was no way we ever expected everybody to come back from the cross-country flight. We knew somebody was going to have an engine out, and we always tell the story about one of our locals that uh, uh, we tease him all the time, but we learned early on that you didn't want to go on a cross-country flight with him because you knew that if you, you, you went on the cross-country flight, he was going to end up down someplace, and so if you did fly with him, you wanted to get so far out in front of him that when his engine did quit, you could have plausible deniability that you actually saw him go down, and you never would turn your head until you were you knew a long ways out in front of him to where you wouldn't see him go down because he would spend the rest of the afternoon packing up his equipment and 
getting it hauled over the fence and put on a trailer and brought home. And that actually was kind of normal in the early days, back in the in the 70s and um, the 80s. We we were having a lot of there was a lot of learning curve going on. We've learned so much more from that um, from that point on. Today. We really, in our area, we simply do not have two-stroke engine failures anymore. They are really a thing of the past. And I always tell everybody in our classes, I say, today's engines that Rotax build, if you have an engine failure, I just about bet you that it was caused by the owner or the operator of the airplane. Not because of stupidity or anything like that, but just a little bit of lack of knowledge about how these things actually operate. And once you get to where you really understand the systems, you understand the aircraft, we can get you to the point where the reliability is really, really high. I, I, I can't remember the last time I've had a two-stroke engine failure. It's just been so many years ago. And we operate the engines very, very reliable. Um, I used to do engine overhauls on a regular basis. In fact, I used to plan cross countries because I knew that if I planned a cross country, I would have an engine overhaul the next week for a job, and you know I could just count on it. Um, that really, we we stopped overhauling engines uh, 15 years ago because the the reliability now in our area is so high that we just don't see the the need for that anymore. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Hopefully, get you up to that same point. One of the primary reasons why we have engine failures is people don't have or don't know the information that they're supposed to know. If you go, you'll see on the website there that I have rotaxaircraftengines.com, um, all of the maintenance manuals, all the parts manuals, the, the, um, um, the setup manuals, service bulletins, the service instructions, the, the tools manual, the accessories manuals, there's, there's literally hundreds of documents on there available for you for free on that website and you'll have total access to everything you need to know about your engine. Most of the engine failures that we're seeing are just simply a lack of information and people making up their own ideas about what they think they should do. And when we start doing that, we start becoming uh, kind of our own R&D department. And as everyone knows, R&D departments spend an awful lot of money and go through a lot of failures in the process of learning about this. Well, there really isn't a need for you to go out and relearn that thing. Once we have you educated and once you understand how things are operating, you've got the Rotax manuals, you've got all the information. If you just simply do it by the manual, those problems will just virtually disappear. So in order to supplement those manuals, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a little bit of the engine theory here. And we've got this... Um, graphic showing up on your on your screen right here. This is a basic two-stroke engine that somebody gave me this graphic a long time ago. I don't even know where it came from, but um, it's not really a Rotax type engine. This is really more of a reed valve engine, but for the purpose of what we're going to talk about, this will explain really what's going on inside that. If we'll look at the piston as it's going up and down, you can see that on the upstroke, it creates a low pressure area in the crankcase. All of the fuel air oil goes into the crankcase through the carburetor in the induction system and goes into the crankcase. That's where we lubricate our, that's why we have oil in that system. That's where we get lubrication for our main bearings, our rod bearings, our uh, wrist pins, our uh, pistons and the cylinder walls. All that lubrication comes into the bottom of the engine to start with. When the piston is on its downstroke, it pressurizes the crankcase and sends that fuel air oil mixture up into the combustion chamber where it undergoes compression check, I mean, the, undergoes the compression cycle. Once it compresses and it gets close to top dead center, we fire the spark plug and we start the fuel burning in a very specific rate as it burns down. And then the piston opens up and it allows the exhaust to accelerate out the exhaust system. Now, as you can see in the graphic here, the air that's accelerating out the exhaust system gets to a point where the the exhaust system expands out, and it's called an expansion pipe. And when it expands out, it lowers the pressure. That low pressure creates a low pressure back all the way back into the inside of the engine, helps to draw the new fuel air mixture out of the crankcase, up through the transfer ports, and into the combustion chamber, and actually out into the exhaust system. On a typical two-stroke engine, we actually have unburned fuel air oil that is in the exhaust system. Now, 
without a properly tuned exhaust system, what ends up happening is we leave a lot of that unburned fuel. The fuel consumption gets really high. It becomes inefficient. And um, so in order to prevent losing that fuel, we have a neck down portion of the exhaust system. And I guess I've got a mouse here. I can kind of point this out. But this neck down portion of the um, exhaust system here starts to contract the, the uh, combustion gases and create a reverse pulse wave that goes and pushes that exhaust uh, or that unburned fuel air oil mixture back into the combustion chamber. Now that timing of that pulse wave is extremely critical. It is for all practical purposes on a two-stroke engine, it is your exhaust valve. Now we don't often think of, we, we typically identify two-stroke engines as not having valves. But in fact, two-stroke engines do have valves. They have an intake valve. In the case of this picture right here, the intake valve really is the piston operating on the transfer ports when it opens and closes. And um, also, we've got a valve in the exhaust system as the piston goes up and down. But even more importantly, the timing of that uh, pulse wave that controls that fuel coming in and out is really, truly our real live uh, valve on that thing. So on two-stroke engines, doesn't matter which one it is. Um, I have on the screen here a picture of a 503 on the left and a 582 on the right. Um, the exhaust systems operate virtually identical on these two ex uh, on these two engines. Um, on the Rotax 582 on the right, it actually has a rotary, a physical rotary intake valve on the intake side of it in order to be able to time the uh, impulse gases coming in. Uh, at the right time so that uh, we can get more horsepower out of the engine. But both of these engines have intake valves and they have exhaust valves. We just don't think of them as having those. So this, this exhaust valve action that's going on through um, the design of the exhaust system is critical. Um, that design of that expansion chamber is critical to the operation. There are aftermarket um, exhaust systems out there which will get more horsepower out of an engine. They will also blow up your engine, so that's an option that you can choose also. Um, we typically find that they are designed to extract that gas out at a perfect rate at full throttle. But the problem is, is in an aircraft engine, we typically don't operate all the time at full throttle. And where we want the most reliability and the most stability in the operation of the engine is in the mid-range. And the exhaust systems that were designed for the Rotax engine are designed to have this very stable range all the way from idle all the way up through full throttle. Modifying that exhaust can give you all kinds of grief. A lot of these guys that hack and chop on the exhaust system in order to get them to fit underneath one of these nice um, cowlings, um, a lot of times they will do themselves um, harm by changing that pulse wave that's in the thing. But it's not just the design of this expansion chamber. We know that Rotax is already designed to operate this thing um, and the exhaust system works perfect on their engines. But there's one other thing that's even more important and it's the number one reason why we're having engine failures in two-stroke engines. And that has to do with engine loading. Now, I hear all the time, I just don't get what engine loading would possibly have to do with this. But let's, let's back up and we'll do just a couple of examples here to show you exactly what's going on with this thing. When we increase the load on the engine, I have a little diagram here that just kind of represents what happens. And I get, a, I get calls like this all the time. In fact, I just had one a year or so ago. Uh, guy calls me up, he's just finished building his GT400 and he says, I've got my A&P over here and he's helping me work on this, on this engine and he's really smart. Um, we've been, we did the test flight on the thing and we saw that the EGTs went too high. And I said, hmm, that's, that's interesting. I said, uh, he, said uh, he said, well, we, we already know what, what the problem is, we just need to rejet the carburetor. But, and, but we don't know what size jet you, that we think we ought to have for this thing. And I have to explain to him that do not change the jets on the carburetor at all. That's not really where the problem lies. And so we go through and we talk about what his gear ratio is and what the propeller um, 
you know, the number of blades it has and the diameter of the blades and the type of blades that he has and all the information. And then we make a little uh, suggestion to him. We say, okay, what I want you to do is I want you not to change the jets, but I want you to go out and I want you to adjust the propeller and add one degree of pitch into the propeller. And he'll typically say something like, well, that's ridiculous. I, I didn't call you to talk about propeller stuff. We've got an EGT problem. I need you to tell me what size jet to do this thing. And so we argue back and forth until he finally says, oh, okay, okay, I guess I called you. I guess I can go do this experiment for you. And I said, by the way, what was the CHT? He says, oh, it was fine. And I said, well, if you don't know what it was, how do you know if it's fine or not? And he says, well, it wasn't too hot, so it must be okay. Well, and I have to explain to him that that's completely erroneous. The, the CHTs that are running low are correlating with the EGTs typically. And so when we see a propeller loading issue, if we've got an underloaded propeller like we have on the, the gauge that's on the right side here, we end up with a case where we get a high EGT and a low CHT. Think of it like um, an analogy would be if your truck was going up a hill at an old pickup without all the electronic stuff on it, but an old pickup with a carburetor and you're going up the hill and you uh, are towing a boat and the cylinder head temperatures are naturally going to climb when you're going up the hill. And because your foot is normally in it, the exhaust gas temperatures were rich or are, are basically a um, an indication of what the mixture is that's inside the engine. So when your foot's in the throttle and you've lugged the engine down, you're normally sending in excess amount of fuel, which means the EGTs will actually go down. And so um, when we unload the engine, like if we were driving that truck going down the hill, there's no load on the engine. The cylinder head temperatures go down, but because we're free-flowing that air and that fuel through the engine and it's going through easier, we're not loading the engine, we're letting the engine, the pistons, um, get away from the top dead center easier, the exhaust gas temperatures typically go up. And we see this constantly. And so the guy with the, the GT400 will, will call and say, you know, we just went out and flew this thing. I can't believe it. He says, you're exactly right. The EGTs came down exactly where they're supposed to be, and the CHTs came up exactly where they were supposed to be also. And so the problem, though, is if you don't understand this concept between propeller loading and the results that you're getting on both EGT and CHT, you start making changes to the engine like you start making a change to the jet, not understanding that, that that's not actually where the problem is. You're fixing a symptom rather than fixing a problem. And the most important thing is that we actually start fixing real problems. If we don't, we end up in a situation where we start to have catastrophic failures of these engines as a result of making the engine operate improperly, unknowing, trying to fix a problem, but here we are, we're, we're causing more problems. Here's an example of detonation, uh, pretty catastrophic, um, eats a lot of um, metal up in a really big hurry. Typically these failures happen over just a few seconds uh, before this kind of a, a failure occurs. Um, if we in the case of that, that last piston that we're looking at there, um, that was a case of actual detonation as a result of unloading the engine, um, or uh, yeah, unloading the engine, getting high EGTs, uh, lowering the temp or raising the temperature inside the combustion chamber to where we got detonation on the pistons. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's another one from underloading the engine where it's actually so underloaded that it exceeds the maximum design speed for the engine and starts shucking pieces off of the piston as a result of, um, of having an overspeed. And this one right here actually is a case of detonation and uh, uh, causing a, um, a split down the piston because it wasn't fit into the, the cylinder wall properly. Here's another example of um, detonation here also. And you can see around the periphery of this piston, um, where we've got melting that's occurring, typical detonation type stuff. I'm going to press through. I'll show you one more piston here that's um, an example of detonation where it's blown a hole right through the top of the piston. And we'll talk about each one of these and why each one of these are happening. Um, oh, I do have one more slide here. 
here's a picture of a piston that suffered detonation um, on an engine for a long period of time and just slowly pounded out the top of this piston. And another one with a crack. I'll come back to these and we'll talk about them each individually. I want to get on to the, the theoretical portion of this a little bit more. So we've decided that this engine loading is a big deal. So what is it that actually controls the engine loading? Uh, propeller diameter. Uh, propeller diameter, um, the larger the diameter, the more parasitic drag we're going to have on the engine. Um, propeller pitch. But propeller pitch is a little bit different. Propeller pitch is actually induced drag. That is the drag that's created by producing the lift. The more lift that we have on the blades or the more angle of attack that we have on the blades, the more induced drag that we produce. The number of blades, once again, more parasitic drag. If you add an extra blade to your engine, you're going to have, um, you're going to have more drag than you had before. And um, it's important to recognize that if we add a blade, that's going to be more parasitic drag. The typical way that we can correct for that is either we have to hack off the diameter, which is parasitic drag, or we have to reduce the pitch. But by reducing the pitch, that's actually induced drag. And we'll show you how that works also. Cord thickness or blade design, big difference in propeller blades. Uh, we have some real thick blades out there like a power fin or a um, brogola prop or a uh, Sensenic, nice thick blades on those types of, um, of propellers, uh, where a warp drive or a um, um, IVO prop, they're pretty thin. They have lower parasitic drag. And then, of course, gear ratio is a, a big deal also. If we're spinning a prop faster, we're going to have more parasitic drag. If we're spinning it slower, we're going to have less, and so on. And so parasitic drag increases with the square of the velocity. That means if we if we double the speed, the amount of drag that we have increases by four times. And just like when we're doing ground school for aircraft, we know that parasitic drag and induced drag are two different types of drag. And we have the curve here showing both induced and parasitic drag. But because the propeller is traveling at a relatively constant speed because of the RPM that the engine's actually turning, um, the parasitic drag remains relatively constant no matter how fast we actually fly the airplane. The amount of change that actually takes place as a result of traveling faster through the air is so insignificant that we consider parasitic drag to, re to be a constant load on the engine. And so when we, when we talk about uh, speeds of the propeller at the tip, we're talking, you know, 500 plus mile an hour prop tip speeds. Now, unlike that, when we're talking about induced drag, it's a completely different issue. So let's talk about what induced drag is. Induced drag is the, um, the pitch of the blades, and the pitch of a blade is simply, on this case here, we've got a Tennessee propeller. Um, that's got, it's a 6830, which means it's 68 inch diameter, but it's 30 inches of pitch. And 30 inches of pitch means that if this was a uh, true Archimedes screw screwing its way through the air in one revolution, it would move the aircraft forward um, 30 inches. And so that's what the 30 inch pitch means. So when we look at this, we can see that if we were to do the math, we would find out that um, a 30 inch pitch at 6500 RPM on a uh, Rotax 503 with a 2.58 gearbox and just a, uh, throwing out a number of say 80% efficiency, we'd end up with that propeller at 6500 RPM trying to pull itself through the air at about 57 miles per hour. Now, at 57 miles per hour, the reason that the aircraft can't go any faster is because the angle of attack of the propeller blades as the airplane goes faster and faster gets reduced because we're moving forward as we go. So when it's static, we have a relatively high load on the propeller blades. When we start going faster and faster, the angle of attack of the oncoming air gets to be thinner and thinner, and we eventually run out of angle of attack. And when we run out of angle of attack, when we look at the formula for lift, we know that we have to have some coefficient of lift in order to be able to produce that forward thrust on the propeller. 
And so the faster we go, the less angle of attack there is. And that means also that the less amount of induced drag that there is. So when we're traveling forward through the air, parasitic drag remains constant. But as we go faster and faster, the induced drag gets less and less and less. Now the problem with that whole theory is, is that that means that the load on the engine is changing. That means that during a static setup, we're actually producing a heavy load, which we get the results that we, that we show, shown on the previous slides where we have heavy load means high CHTs and low EGTs. Now, EGTs just basically being a representation of the mixture. Low EGTs meaning that we have excess fuel in there, means that we have more carbon buildup in there, that we have more potential for sticky rings, that we have more potential. It's interesting because everyone is always concerned about high EGTs and they're always wanting to run the engine rich because if they run it rich, the engine won't blow up immediately. We can make the engine run longer. We can keep it from actually frying. When we get too high to EGTs, the potential for an engine failure becomes almost instantaneous. I mean, a high EGT to the point where we get detonation and uh, two high EGTs, we can fry the engine literally within seconds. But interestingly, when we look at it statistically, we see that there are more engine failures as a result of running the engines too rich and ending up with sticky rings and excessive wear and all of the problems associated with a rich mixture, there's actually more engine failures as a result of running the engine too rich than there is of running it too lean. But in this example we have here, we have zero mile an hour and we have cruise speed at top speed here where we're cruising along at, um, at our full flight speed and we got a very low load and now all of a sudden we get the characteristics that associate themselves with unloaded propeller. So we end up with lower CHTs, but higher EGTs. And so this transition from low speed, where we're overloaded, to cruise flight, where we're underloaded, really starts to play a bit of a problem for us. And I'm going to go to one other slide here to show you about this. This is basically representing on this slide the induced drag that decreases as we go faster and faster and faster. Just like an aircraft in flight, the faster the airplane goes, the lower of angle of attack, the less coefficient of lift we need, and so the less amount of induced drag we have as we go faster and faster. So we were doing a little bit of a um, survey around the country of who's having the most engine failures, and it was interesting because when we started surveying this, the results were astounding, and I correlated it with some experience that we saw up there. And I, I, I noticed this correlation between um, the powered parachute community who I was seeing people that were brand new but had a lot of number of hours and were operating powered parachutes very successfully and the number of complaints and the number of engine failures was really low. And then as I went to the trike community the number of engine failures started to go up. When I went to the airplane community, it went up another 50% on top of that. And then when I got to the helicopter um, community, I saw just un unbelievable amount of engine failures in the two-stroke helicopter community. And we'll talk about why that is uh, also. But if we look at a powered parachute, we've got a really interesting phenomenon here. Um, on climb out for a powered parachute, uh, we climb out at a blazing speed of, uh, well, we'll call it 26 miles an hour. And then we level off for high speed flight at, oh uh, yeah, that's right, it's 26 miles an hour also. And then when we do the high speed pass down past all your buddies down there, uh, once again, we're at 26 miles an hour. In this case, because the forward velocity remained constant, the amount of induced drag remained constant. And because the propeller RPM and the parasitic drag remains constant simply because of the RPM, we saw this correlation between both drags always being very consistent. And so once we were able to get a engine, gearbox, propeller combination set up, it didn't even matter if we chose a good propeller. We I have seen some of the most hacked up I've seen propeller blades on powered parachutes that were 
set up with the pitch to give that aircraft about 80 mile an hour forward flight. Totally inappropriate propeller, but the cool part was once we've actually set the angle of the blades to any pitch that gives us a load on the engine that's right in the right spot, that load remains constant no matter what the regime of flight is and the number of problems. If we can set it up and we get perfect EGT and we get perfect CHT, the, the inside of that engine runs perfect. And we see on our aircraft, we actually have gotten to the point where when we know how to set them up properly, we can get the engines to where we typically run our two-stroke engines, uh, even though the factory recommends 250 hours, we consistently run our engines well past 400 hours. And at 400 hours, if I was to take one of our engines, and I have one of them actually in our classroom that we use for our students to look at, um, and I was to take the exhaust off at 10 hours just after I've done the break-in on the engine, and I would to take a picture of the piston, the rings, the propeller dome, the cross hatch on the sonar walls, and then take that photograph and put it on the wall and then come back 400 hours later, never having decarboned the engines, never having had the heads off of the engine, but take a picture of that exhaust port, exactly the same stuff, looking at the piston, the rings, the sonar walls, uh, the piston dome, and I gave you both of those pictures, you would not be able to tell the difference between those two. And it all has to do with having enough EGT, enough um, temperature in there where we're burning off the exhaust, burning off all of the carbon deposits, and having enough CHT to where um, it's just balanced, just in that right spot. And when you do that, the engine runs perfectly, it runs smoothly. You know, Everybody says, well, that, that just doesn't seem reasonable. You know, even the book says we're supposed to change the spark plugs every um, 25 hours. But the reason that it says you're supposed to change the spark plugs every 25 hours is because this engine is designed to be operated by such a large number of people in, in really um, adverse conditions. If you can actually get the engine set up in such a way that it is actually operating correctly, it's just like a car. I mean, we run spark plugs in a car now, 100,000 miles, and we never have to change the things. We can, we can get those same kinds of results once we have that fuel air mixture and that engine loading proper on the inside of the engine. So when we started to look at the other types of trikes, the problem we saw was that the larger the speed variation that we had in the aircraft, the more difficult that it was to control the load on the engine. During cruise flight, we may be able to pitch the prop so that it's loaded properly uh, during cruise flight, but it would always mean that during the takeoff, we would always be overloaded. And so the faster the airplane went, the more difficult it was to control that. And right now, I really tell our students, I have never found a combination that works perfect on an aircraft that has a top speed of over 75 miles an hour. And I constantly, constantly, constantly hear from people that have fast aircraft with two-stroke engines on the thing, and they're fighting this problem. And most all of them end up solving the problem by simply running the engine so rich that they end up with excessive amounts of carbon buildup in the thing, but they keep it rich enough that the engine doesn't blow up. And that's okay. It just means you're probably going to have to go in there and decarbon on a much more frequent basis. I I hear all the time guys where they're having to decarbon every 50 to 100 hours. In fact, the maintenance manual calls for um, inspecting to see if it needs to be decarboned every 100 hours at least. And if it does need to be decarboned, if it's starting to get um, carbon buildup on the rings, the rings are starting to stick, um, then it's definitely time to take the engine apart and decarbon the engine. But once we've got it set up properly to where we get this thing in this right load, we actually find that we we can burn off all of those carbon deposits. The, the fuel air ratio is perfect with inside the engine. That loading, that very specific loading um, on the propeller as a choice of a, the right gearbox, the right propeller, the right number of blades, the right design of blades um, combined with the type of aircraft that it is. And that's quite a science that's involved with that. Um, we can get to the point where we get good results. The faster the airplane goes, the more difficult it gets to be in that same situation. Consequently, 
we have seen in the helicopter market this massive problem with just literally hundreds and hundreds of two-stroke powered helicopters um, having engine related problems. And it literally has to do with this engine loading situation. When we grab a hold of that collective, we're literally using it as a valve adjustment tool because when we pull up on that collective, we overload that engine. We slow down that engine from um, being able to, for the piston to decelerate away from that flame front travel that's expanding out in there. And when we unload that collective, we unload that engine, allows that engine to spool up and sometimes overspeed and all the results that come as a result of uh, underloading, which are high EGTs and detonation as a result of hitting high EGTs. Um, all, and so it becomes very difficult. And you've seen over the years the, the number of two-stroke helicopter manufacturers that have just struggled and struggled with this whole problem. And it's really a correlation between understanding um, that I've got a friend here locally and he, he says he's got it figured out on helicopters. He actually put on a choke handle on the thing and he had to do that because if he wanted to actually move the collective and he would reduce the collective even slightly, it would, it would lean out the engine and he's gone through multiple engines now because of that. So he put a choke handle on it and now if he wants to reduce the collective while he's in flight, he actually has to flood the engine momentarily while he does that. It still doesn't solve all of the problems, but he told me the last time, he says he's got it all figured out as long as he doesn't move the collective and doesn't move the cyclic and doesn't move the throttle, everything works perfect. But I'm not sure that's actually the best way to operate the helicopter. So the magic number on loading happens to fall right into, uh, if we go to the, the road tax manual, and in this case right here we've got a, we've got a, what is this, 582 it looks like. And you'll notice that the maximum horsepower on the Rotax chart shows right between 6250 and 6500 RPM. Ironically, that is the magic potion for your engine. If you can go to full throttle on your engine and it develops between 6250 and 6500 RPM during any segment of flight, then you're probably in good shape. You've got that engine loaded correctly. Now the trick is if you're static sitting on the ground and you rev it up you want to get at least 6250. But oftentimes if you don't have a good propeller gearbox um, combination and you're at full throttle and then on the climb out you start to level off the RPM starts to exceed the 6500 RPM. That's an example of an airplane that's going too fast and it's unloading the propeller as a result of this induced drag dropping off as we hit higher and higher speed. Now, once we load it at full throttle like this, it will operate correctly down through all the rest of the range and you don't really have to worry about the bottom end of the engine. We're looking at a reference point for the proper loading and Rotax has a chart for that also. Look also at the, at the torque curve and we see pretty much the same thing occurring in the engines. We've got a maximum torque occurring between 6,000 and 6,200 RPM. And then if we go to, um, in the manual, you'll actually find that there's a, a whole section in there that talks about this propeller loading issue and how the power goes uh, down and how the, the torque goes away and where the engine was actually designed to be operated correctly. And this is really a whole topic in itself and actually in our 120 hour maintenance course we spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about um, propeller theory and engine loading and how all of this happens. But this is actually good reading. You have access to this on the website that I gave you for Rotax. Um, all those manuals are free and you can get access to this and, and take a look at this horsepower torque curve um, that shows up in the manual in there. So. Just to reiterate, let's go back and talk about the conditions for overloading versus underloading. We have increased load shows up as high CHT and low EGTs. The problem with high CHTs is that we start to, when we overload the engine, the ability of the um, flame front travel to um, push that piston down at a very 
controlled rate has to do with loading. It's just like if you were to put your car in fifth gear and try and go out of the parking lot with a manual transmission. You're going to hear the pinging and the knocking from that detonation going on there because we're not allowing that, um, that flame front to expand out and decrease its pressure. So it basically just uh, increases in pressure inside the combustion chamber until it explodes, and that's what we call the detonation. So increased, we get a high CHT, low EGT. Low EGTs are just as bad as high CHTs because low EGTs also don't burn off the gases. They have a tendency to leave carbon deposits behind. When we get a higher, or not a higher, but a proper EGT, we will get all the combustion gases burned off. We will have a nice clean running engine on the inside, and we don't get that, that relationship there. So um, EGT and CHT um, should correspond almost directly with um, the chart that we see in the Rotax manual for the fuel consumption. And the, the EGT you will see has got a peak point before we get to full throttle, and that's the cruise range. And EGT basically is showing us where our mixture. So the highest EGTs are correlated with the leanest mixtures. The reason that the EGT actually comes down as we get closer to full throttle is because we're using excessive fuel in the carburetor to use it for cooling. And the CHT should follow along, pretty much along with the RPM of the engine. As we pull more power out of it, we are using up more heat, we're putting more energy into the engine, and so it shows up with a direct correlation, a straight line curve, if you will, for CHT. When we go to look at spark plugs, we don't want to see them overly white. Overly white is an indication that um, we actually have a lean condition. Uh, a dark color on the spark plug, a black, um, for that matter, um, is showing a rich indication. Uh, we can actually read the spark plugs in more than just one area. Um, we can actually read idle, mid-range, and full throttle all on one spark plug, and I'll show you how to do that here in a second. Um, when we look at the fuel consumption, it's important to recognize that the fuel consumption changes and the mixture changes as we go through different RPM settings. So in the case of um, this engine here, we're showing that idle on the left-hand side, we're showing a very, very rich condition. And then as we get up to the cruise range, which is typically around the 5,500 RPM range for most engines, um, we're the leanest, and we're going to see the highest EGTs right there. And then as you add throttle to the engine, we're going to want to see that EGT come back down because we're adding excess fuel into the engine. And so that's a normal correlation that you should see. If you don't see this EGT decrease at full throttle, it's probably an indication that something isn't set up right. And we should be able to see this correlation very clear on the EGT following almost identical to this fuel consumption curve. When the engine's set up properly, it will act exactly like this, and it will be very, very um, close to exactly this range here, just correlated in, in um, EGT indication. Now, um, there's a couple of things that you may notice. Uh, if you get a case where you are um, underloaded on your engine, which is one of the more common problems for the faster aircraft, an underloaded engine where you're, um, you're at full throttle, and you, it was fine during, it was fine during uh, climb out because you're putting a load on that propeller. But all of a sudden, you left it at full throttle, and now you lower the nose and you start accelerating. And as you go faster and faster, you'll notice your EGTs start to rise because once again, the induced drag is going down, and the correlation with the induced drag going down is that the EGTs go up. And so, what often will happen is the airplane goes faster and faster and faster is the temptation is to see that EGT start to rise, and your first response is, oh, I need to back out of the throttle. But if you look on this chart right here, we were actually richer at full throttle if we were to pull the throttle back. What are we actually doing? We're actually leaning out the engine even worse, and that's that point where we usually get that first power reduction to keep those gauges from going too high, 
and boom, all of a sudden we get a failure. And it's because we were richer, and then when we pulled the power back into the mid-range, we leaned it out more and we fried the thing. If you have a case where you don't have this proper loading of this engine, and you notice as you level off and you leave it at full throttle, and the EGTs actually start to rise excessively, the situation should not be to reduce the throttle, but rather put the nose of the aircraft back up into a climb, and then once you've got it loaded really heavily, back it on down through that range, get it back up over on the other side of the curve, somewhere over around 4,000, 4,500 RPM, where it's just as rich as it was when we were at full throttle, and then lower the nose and start heading back to home to solve the problem. But we oftentimes get people trying to rejet the engine to compensate for things like propeller loading. And that's totally ridiculous because it's when we rejet the carburetor, we're rejetting for all ranges of the carburation. If we're changing out the main jet um, and we start slowing down the aircraft, we have we have screwed up that um, that range at the lower setting. Now I told you that I would tell you how to read a spark plug um, through all three ranges. If you've just been out flying for a half hour or so and you land, you should be able to let the engine cool down. Remember, we never pull a spark plug on a two-stroke engine while the engine is hot. We need to let it cool down before we ever pull the plug. So if we let the engine cool down, we pull the plug out, we can actually look right on the face of the spark plug is typically where we will get an indication of what the idle circuit is doing. And if we remember looking back on that chart we had before, we're going to have an excessive amount of, of um, mixture at idle. Let's go back to that chart and we'll look at that. Everyone says, well, why is it so rich at idle? Well, there's something missing on a Bing carburetor that we have on like a Marvel Schlauber carburetor on a Continental or a Lycoming, and that is an accelerator pump. We don't have an accelerator pump, so if we were just to jump on that throttle really quick, there wouldn't be enough fuel in there. So what we do with the Bing carburetor, in order to keep it simple, we just run the engine slightly rich down at the low RPMs, and then when we accelerate on through, there's enough excess fuel that it will not stumble, and when it's properly set up, um, we don't have that, that stumbling occurrence. So back on the spark plug. Because we know that it's properly supposed to be running rich, it's not uncommon to see the top of the spark plug up here actually show up as black. That's normal. That's because that's the, that is the idle circuit. When we go into the mid-range, right the top part of the white insulator, that's reading mid-range. That should be a light tan color when this is operating perfectly. It shouldn't be completely white. It should show some white tan, uh, light tan to a tan color on that. Um, if it's showing up as black, that's just an indication that uh, you're running a little little rich in the mid-range in there. Or if you'll remember back on propeller loading, that's showing you that if it's if it's too white, showing you that you're unloaded too much. If it's too black, showing you you're loaded up too much. And then as we go down the insulator, down into the inside of the barrel of the plug in there, that's that's indicating full throttle. And this is not perfect science and every engine combination is a little bit different, but this correlation with thousands of plugs that I've looked at um, will show these three different ranges all on one spark plug. Um, you can get a pretty good idea of what that engine is doing throughout that entire range by reading the spark plug in this manner. So that should be a tool that um, you should be able to use when we're talking about that. Now I know we're getting towards the top of the hour here and we're going to need to save some time for uh, questions here. But let's just talk about some of the consequences of overloading. Uh, we can have a result of damage to pistons, to cylinders, to crankshafts. Uh, overloading the engine raises the cylinder head temperatures, lowers the EGTs. Lower exhaust gas temperatures result in carbon buildup. Uh, lower exhaust gas temperatures typically indicate a richer mixture. And um, this picture here is an example of even on the bottom of the engine with excessive cylinder head temperatures burning off um, carbon and actually melting on the bottom of the piston. There's actually, uh, I wish I knew exactly where it was, but um, the EAA has on one of their publications, uh, I think it's online, um, I have done an article called 
uh, detonation in two-stroke engines. And this would be a really good one for you guys to read up on. It talks a lot more about um, this detonation that's occurring from um, overloaded, underloaded, and the combinations like that. I wish I knew which, um, which article it was in. Maybe um, I can find that for you. But um, I think today we probably should do some questions. I know that we've taken up an entire hour already with this, and I can go on for more, many more hours, but I think we've kind of got a, a, a good idea of what is um, what we're looking at here. All right. Um, one of the uh, questions that uh, that has come in this evening is, uh, how does a beginner select the correct propeller for a particular engine and airplane? All right. Are there some general guidelines that uh, you should keep in mind to uh, keep beginners out of trouble? Yeah, that's a great question. Here's the here's the best thing that you could possibly do when you're a beginner at this. The manufacturers of these aircraft, even though m many manufacturers and dealers and individuals out there, the way that they figure out what the best combination is, is they go out and they bolt a prop on something and they go fly it for a couple hundred hours and then they blow up a couple engines and they say, you know, that's probably a bad combination. And then somebody else comes up with a different combination and it works really good. And so everybody starts copying him. That's okay as long as it's exactly the same engines. But my recommendation is recognize that there is, I mean, this is, this is really, truly a science, and I would recommend that you go to the manufacturer of your airplane. He has usually already done his homework, and he knows what works best, or go to another one of the, the experts in your area that's got a lot of experience with these two-stroke engines and uh, knows the situation. We train all of our light sport repairmen with maintenance ratings, uh, which are available on our website. Those guys have a pretty good idea of how to go about selecting a prop and the dangers of selecting the wrong prop. But um, it, this literally is, you know, uh, it, it's a very scientific process. In our longer course, we teach the guys how to calculate pitch and loading and make some of those choices. But it is, um, it can be uh, a real challenge to you unless you really understand this. Trial and error can be one way, but um, the big issue is it's very easy to end up with a propeller that is just pitched to get the right load. And if we pitch it to get the right load, we're doing good for the engine. But oftentimes, that's not really even close to the right pitch for the type of aircraft and the RPM that it's operating at. So our best suggestion is to find an expert that's been through this process and that knows um, your aircraft, because it is aircraft, gearbox, engine, blade design, diameter, pitch, number of blades, all of those all come to form this complete package that makes up this thing. Here's the, here's the thing to remember. Everything on the engine should be stock from the, from the get-go. If your engine is not set up stock, you probably have a problem if it's not running correctly. So. When I have an engine that comes in for troubleshooting and someone just can't make their airplane run correctly, they are really the simplest engines. All I do, I go through the engine, I put everything back to stock, I make sure the propeller is the right propeller and it's getting the right loading on this thing, and when I run the thing, it works perfect every single time. It's that simple. If you're not running stock jets, you are probably got a problem. If you're not running something else on the aircraft stock, you're just into the R&D um, from the from the get go there. So these engines, when they're set up stock, when they're operated like the manual tells us to. I mean, Rotex has put in millions of dollars into getting these maintenance manuals out there with good information. And if you just simply do it by the manual, it is a little bit weak on the propeller stuff. And that's why I recommend that you get an expert so that you can keep experimenting. And fixed pitch props are certainly more difficult. Uh, ground adjustable are easier to get it loaded, but uh, then we've got this whole issue with getting it performing well also. So use an expert. That would be my best recommendation for you. All right. Uh, early on, you had mentioned um, about overhauling, and uh, Brian's wondering if you said that, if he heard you correctly, that you never uh, require an overhaul on the, on the engine? This is actually an interesting subject that we talk about. We have gotten to the point now 
where we, in our facility, we, we don't do engine overhauls at all anymore. We run the engines to 400 hours, and we consider them to still have 400 hours life left in them, and we sell them. And the reason that we do that is because we have seen the reliability on overhauled equipment. There are so many people out there that are honing these cylinders and not doing the job right and getting bad results. And then Rotex gets a really bad rap after the fact because people are out there putting these engines back in service and they're just not doing it right. They're, they're not doing it the way that they should. We've actually found that by putting a new engine on, the cost per flight hour is cheaper than it is by sending the engines in for overhaul. And so um, we, we kind of have our own little uh, system that we use. Um, I do not do overhauls on two-stroke engines anymore. I don't consider it to be cost-effective. These engines are not terribly expensive, and for the number of hours that you're getting on the things, um, by the time you've got 400 hours on it, you can sell it for the half the price of a new one. You can take that 400 hours and put it right back into the cost of a new engine, and we have found that it is hands down uh, a better choice, and especially with the number of really poor overhauls. You know, there's nothing worse than spending a couple thousand dollars on an overhaul and then only to get 50 hours more out of the thing after after someone did a bad job on the overhaul. So, and there's so many people that'll buy an engine that's in good condition with half life on the thing. Um, you know, we've, there's an overwhelming number of people that would rather pay 2,000 than 4,000 for a new engine. So. Um, that's just our that's our preference, but we're not we do not do overhauls. All right, uh, Bill has read about fuel additives that keep carbon buildup down, such as sea foam and Marvel Mystery Oil. What are your uh, opinions of those products or similar products? Well, remember that um, the Rotax manual doesn't um, list these as a, approved. Um, we get mixed results. Um, I do surveys about all of these products. Um, on the road. Uh, sea foam is one that I've never used myself, but I constantly hear bad things about it. Um, it's totally anecdotal. Um, I have no personal experience with that. Um, nowadays, with the good oils that we have out there, uh, the number one oil that has been being used in the two-stroke engines is um, the Pennzoil. Uh, Pennzoil is um, about 80% of the market out there. AMS oil synthetic is next in line, and then it kind of filters on down in ratios from there. Um, the Penz oil just, they stopped making the current Penz oil that everybody had been using, and so now everybody's kind of scrambling to figure out what oils they are using in the past. But these engines, nowadays, with the oils that we currently have, the need to do decarboning using these chemicals does not exist anymore. When we operate them correctly, we can eliminate, we, we simply don't have any carbon buildup. I'm telling you, I pull the engine apart and pull the exhaust off at 400 hours and I look inside, there is no carbon buildup on anything. It's just like it was at 10 hours. And it's all about, it's all about setting it up properly so that you don't have excessive carbon buildup and you can do that. I've seen it done so many, many, many times where, and I've seen it on all engines. There are some idiosyncrasies with each one of these engines, and they, um, you know, there there are many nuances about the different oils and the different engines, and um, so we can't use them universally. Uh, but 582s, um, I would be recommending uh, the use of of Pennzoil, um, or nowadays I guess you're going to have to choose something new. There's a lot of experimentation going on. Um, right now, the problem is is we don't consider any oil until we get you know. 30, 40 engines that have been using it for four or 500 hours each, and then we tear the engines down and look to see what we're getting, and then correlate it with whether or not they were set up properly. Most all of these oils will actually work just fine in the engines. Most of the bad rep of the oils comes from people not setting up the engines correctly, and then they're just blaming it on the oils for carbon buildup. Well, that's totally bogus, because I can have oil work in one engine, perfectly fine and put it in the next engine and make it work lousy. And so once you understand that it's really all about setting up the engines properly and operating them properly, um, you know, these oil issues really are not as big a deal as most people think. And 
when you start down the path of additives, it's perfectly okay. It says right on the side of your airplane it's an experiment. Go for it, you know. Just pass on to us what you got for results, and we'll just keep passing those on to everybody and accumulating data out there. But as far as I'm concerned, there is no need for any additives at this point in time with all of the Rotax two-stroke engines. We're able to get excellent results without doing that. All right. Uh, Daniel is wondering when uh, density altitude increases. He has difficulty increasing the RPM past a third throttle uh, after restarting his Rotax uh, 503 DC engine uh, and after a shutdown of about 30 minutes. Any okay. thoughts on how to remedy sure. that? Yeah. So here's the deal. There, there are, there's, there's two or three issues that you have going on here. Um, we used to we used to have, um, there was an invention that was created by Mike Jacober in Alaska uh, called the Rocky Mountain System, and it was basically an in-flight mixture adjustment uh, for the engine. And um, we went up and taught two back-to-back -back courses in Anchorage up there um, to the guys that were doing that, and everybody in the, in the shop there, every one of the trikers anyway, they all had um, this in-flight mixture adjusting set up. And I started asking questions about why this was necessary and all this stuff. And when we got down to the very end of this, what we really determined is that they had so many of these trikes were set up with propellers that were overloading the engine, they were experiencing the characteristics of an overloaded engine, which are, once again, overloaded engines, EHTs go up, EGTs go down. And when the EGTs go down, it means that we're running the thing a little bit rich, and so we start to get improper performance on the thing. Once we got all those guys up there trained, almost all of them have now switched over and run back to regular stock jets on the thing. Now, an overloaded condition will have a tendency to make the engine lug in the mid-range. Um, if, if you have too high a moment of inertia on these engines, when you start swinging a big three-blade, 68, 72-inch uh, warp drive propeller, that's a lot of inertia. And so it has a tendency during the acceleration to slow down that process and not allow it to wrap up the RPM as quickly as it needs. And if it's already overloaded and you add throttle in the thing and you start bringing it up into the, um, into the mid range, it's not able to catch up with itself. And so it ends up putting more fuel into the engine and kind of sluggishly gets in that mid range. Now the other issue is you need to realize that when those needles especially on old airplanes, this is real common on old airplanes, the needle is set down into the needle jet, and in flight they sit there and vibrate. And because they're vibrating, they're actually making that hole bigger. And so in the mid-range, it's not uncommon to end up with a rich mixture simply because the needle and the jet are pounding them out each other, making it larger and larger, increasing the mixture on the thing. If your engine isn't running well and it is properly pitched, if you're getting that combination where you're between 6250 and 6500 during all segments of flight at full throttle, it's probably not the propeller is the issue. It's probably related to that needle and jet. And many of the times I will fix that problem by simply going in and buying two new needles and two new jets and replace those in there and we can get rid of that mid-range rich combination. Now, these, I, I tell my wife Carol all the time who gets calls daily about troubleshooting these kind of engines, it is virtually impossible to troubleshoot these problems over the phone because all we get is we get the information that the customer knows about. 99.9999% of the time when I get a customer that actually brings the airplane in, there's a whole bunch of missing information. And so I caution you. I've given you some ideas of where you can go hunt, but I caution you that unless these engines are a complete unit. You change one thing, it changes everything else. And so they either work perfect or they quit. And that's our two modes of operation that we get on these things. So you can't have one thing screwed up and then compensate for it and continue to operate the engine. It's just a setup for that thing to actually um, cause of failure. So it's, it's about having everything on the engine perfect. That's why when we say, you know, we've got a 20-year-old engine and it's going in for overhaul, but it comes back with the same electronics, you know, the same 
uh, case, the same cylinders, the same heads, the you know the same carburetors, the same exhaust. Oh boy, there's so many of those things in there that can cause a, a problem. And so we've got all of these variables that all combined together can cause an engine to fail. And I've seen many times where a guy's got a bad carburetor, blows up his engine, sends it out for overhaul because it blew up, puts it all back together, pulls that same carburetor back, back on the thing, and goes out and blows it up again. That's just craziness. There's no reason to do that. So when you think of these engines, think about them as a complete package, everything perfect, or don't fly the thing. All right. Uh, Jack is having a debate at uh, his local airport as to which is better, mixing oil with fuel in the can, in the fuel can, or using oil injection. Uh, most of the, the debaters are using uh, Rotex 503s, but uh, what do you think is the best? Okay. One, everyone is afraid of oil injection systems, and I have seen several oil injection failures. The problem with an oil injection failure is normally it's not just an engine seizure, but remember when we've got an oil injection pump, it fails to lubricate the bearings and the connecting rod, um, the, the wrist pin bushings, all of that stuff on the bottom of the engine also takes a hit. So if we do have an um, a oil pump failure, it can be a pretty costly mistake to make. However, one of the ways that we consistently are able to operate these engines to the full life um, and do it extremely reliable is by the use of an oil injection system. The oil injection system doesn't pump all of that excess oil in at the lower RPMs, it just does it at the top end. And so we get less carbon buildup, we get longer life. It's one of the it's one of the tricks that we use in order to be able to never have to decarbon the engine when it's set up properly. The oil injection pumps are extremely reliable. The, every single oil injection pump I've ever seen fail, it was caused by the owner doing something stupid or not aware, not running a filter in line, contaminating the pump, continuing to operate the oil injection pump. If you have an engine out there and you find that it's leaking oil into your float bowls or into your carburetor or excessive smoke during the startup on a vertical uh, running engine, that may mean that that oil injection pump check valve is actually starting to fail. There's no reason to continue running that thing if that oil injection pump has failed. But we've got clues on the thing. If there's air in the lines on that oil injector pump, don't be operating it that way. But every single failure that I ever see on these things is caused by the owner operators. And um, every one of my aircraft always um, nowadays all have oil injection pumps. I'm not afraid of them. I consider them to be extremely reliable. If I didn't think they were reliable, and well, Rotax thinks they're reliable, or they wouldn't sell them with that. So um, I don't think that it's I don't think that it's particularly dangerous, but it does require maintenance, and you've got to make sure that it's set up properly, and that you do a little maintenance on the thing, and you check to make sure that you um, aren't doing things wrong with it. But um, I am I'm not afraid of oil injection systems at all. In fact, I consider it one of the ways that it's easier for us to get long life out of the engine. Um, but, you know, we operated without that for years and years and years. Some of the failures come from guys not using the oil injection pump, but leaving it connected, and then because it's running dry, do damage to it, and then hook it up later and start running an oil injection. That's just a setup for uh, failure right there. So, um, but. I don't, I don't know that anyone's going to win the battle at your EAA group. Um, I've given you both sides of the argument, but I'm certainly not opposed to the use of them, and Rotax is not opposed to the use of them, or they wouldn't put them on there. All right. Uh, quite a few questions uh, surrounding uh, the ethanol blended fuels. Um, have, you, have we seen any issues relating to uh, you know, the 10% ethanol um, versus the regular unleaded, and what about uh, fuel additives like uh, stable or stable for blended uh, fuels? Uh, any uh, issues along that line? Okay, well, I'll, I'll reiterate what I said about the other additives. The stable and all of that kind of stuff, um, I, don't, I don't personally recommend those because um, we consider that fuel to have a 30-day life when we're putting it into an aircraft. And if you are not going to fly it out in 30 days, dump it out. That's my feelings on, on, on the whole subject. We know that if we had two airplanes halfway filled up, one with 100 low lead and one with 
auto fuel um, that if we went out and we left it sitting outside for a week and we went out to the one with ab gas, we'd sump it and we would get water um, in the sump, guaranteed, because of the condensation and the uh, going on inside the tanks. There's exactly the same amount of water in the other one, but when you sump it, you won't get it out because the alcohol is absorbing all of that. So we know that it is absorbing water just as it sits in high humid environments. It absorbs more. Um, we know that fuel degrades. We know that fuel sitting in fuel tanks at uh, low volume stations sits there for a long, long time. You don't really know what the quality is. So we buy we high, buy high quality fuel. We try and get it with as least amount of alcohol as we possibly can. Uh, I noticed at um, Oshkosh that uh, the premium pumps all were non-alcoholed, and I thought that was kind of cool. We we typically use the premium even on the Rotax engines that allow the use of the um, of the uh, lower grade fuel simply because uh, it'll hold that hot, that octane a little bit longer. Um, we talk in that article that's on the um, EAA website about detonation in your two-stroke, we talk about this fuel issue also. Um, water will get into it. When you're um, running water into the inside of the engine, um, you know, it can get into the bearings, so we like to uh, be careful with that. Um, I just did a, um, a home builder tip, which will be coming out sometime this year on preserving your two-stroke engine. Um, look for that sometime in the future on the home builder tips. Um, preserving the engine will really protect that bottom end of that engine so that you're not getting uh, any of that water in there. Airplanes that are outside, it's really all about protection. I don't think anybody needs to panic about the ethanol blended fuels at less than 10%. Rotax has now approved that. It's in the manual. But uh, uh, there are consequences for using old fuel um, that have water in it. The additives, once again, I really don't have an opinion one way or the other. Just experiment around with it. And if you blow up an engine, send me an email and let me know what happened. The stables and stuff like that, I have not heard any bad stuff about it at all. Um, and once again, I don't use it, so it's all anecdotal evidence once again. So, um, But um, we have lots of people operating alcohol fuels. In, here in California, we're stuck with alcohol at our stations around our area. We operate very successful without any problems with the alcohol fuels. It, the problems that we see associated with what we think are alcohol-related problems, typically when I get my hands on that engine, I find out that it is only one possible problem, but there's still another whole grouping of problems that contributed to the failure or to the problem. It, it goes back to the same old thing. These things are really... Um, an integrated engine where everything has to work well and you've got to use the right fluids. And we just recommend dump your fuel. That's one reason why we like the oil injection pump because you can simply take that fuel out and put it in your car and go burn it out. Your car doesn't care. It's developing a whole 15 horsepower going down the freeway and it's got computers to take care of anything that's not right in it. So it doesn't really matter how much garbage you pump up in those things. But we're pulling so much power out of these things, we need good quality fuel buy it from a reputable station, low alcohol as you possibly can. Um, don't mix, if you are mixing oils, don't mix the oil till just before you go flying. We know that the oil has a tendency to degrade the octane level and over time it will affect that longer, so we like to mix it just before and use up the portions that you get. Don't store it around for a long time. Um, a lot of little tips like that which will, which will help. All right. Uh, sticking with the, the ethanol blended fuels, are there any issues with uh, fiberglass uh, tanks? Uh, Richard's heard that those are bad uh, to use with uh, the ethanol fuels. Yeah, and he's right about that. There's um, quite a few reports of some of the new additives, um, and we don't know if it's exactly the ethanols or the methanols or the additives or what, uh, but we've had um, quite a few reports of um, different types of fiberglass tanks. And remember, when we say fiberglass, we're kind of stroking with a really broad brush there because um, it really depends on what the, um, what the um, medium is that they're using in the fiberglass. When we say fiberglass, we just kind of throw it out there. Was it 
uh, vinyl ester resin, polyester resin, e you know, one of a hundred different epoxies that are used in the aviation field. And so we are having some, especially of the older style um, that are starting to come apart. Uh, be real careful with those. It starts to degrade the fiberglass on a very microscopic level. That runs down and plugs up fuel filters. Um, we see the tanks starting to leak as a result of it, uh, but probably the, some of the worst detriments come from the fact that we're getting uh, fiberglass particles and sludge and um, the actual epoxy or the resins coming through the fuel system and we see it gunking up the inside of the tanks, uh, the inside of the carburetors and jets and stuff like that also. All right. Uh, Corey is wondering, he has a uh, uh, CHT temperature difference of between 40 and 50 degrees in flight. He's running a Rotax 503 with a single carb. Um, any way that you can think of to remedy that? Yeah, let me let me go to a different slide for Corey there. Um, the most common problem for a um, single carb um, situation is right here. Let's look at this slide. Um, it's critical that the carburetor be mounted perpendicular to the engine. The jet on the just going to do a little highlighter here. The jet comes right out of this spot right here. And so what ends up happening is the fuel disperses into the engine both ways going down the splitter. So there's a little splitter right in the top of this, and that fuel comes down and goes through both sides. And typically, if you have a case where you're having high EGT one way or the other, that carburetor may be tilted over to one side or the other, causing that fuel to go more down one side. When you rotate that carburetor, now the fuel comes out right over here on the side. And so most of it will go down one hole and air will go down the other hole. So um, that's the first place we look when we have a single carb split EGT is to start looking for carburetor being mismounted. And probably even more important than that is if you've got junky gauges on the thing, there's nothing worse than people out there trying to tweak their engine to make the gauges read right when the gauges are nothing but garbage. These analog gauges, boy, you've got to be so careful with them. I just automatically um, tell you that if you're bringing, a, bringing an engine in with analog gauges, Everything that you told me about what the EGTs and CHTs and RPM are doing is all bogus information. And I get my digital gauges out and I double check everything before I make any assumptions about what the aircraft gauges are saying. Um, I would say more times than not, the analog gauges are wrong to the point where it could cause an engine failure. So don't follow the gauges. Make sure you get some backup information. In the case of your single carb, read those spark plugs. They're telling you what's really going on. And if they're, you know, if one side's really black and one side's uh, lean, well, then maybe it is um, that carb. But you can physically just go out and set that carb, make sure that it's um, perpendicular to the engine. That'll that'll help solve that, I think. All right. Uh, you were talking about carbon buildup earlier. Is the uh, is there a difference if the engine is inverted? Uh, Properly set up engine on a, on an airplane will have a tendency to allow the um, the oils to foul spark plugs, but it doesn't change how the engine operates. We can operate the engines extremely successful with um, uh, an inverted situation. I would not. The only hassle with inverted is typically. Over time, um, it gets to be a hassle because if you let it sit for a couple of weeks, some of the oil will leak down and foul out the spark plugs, and that you know that that starts to be a little bit of a pain. Um, sometimes having to pull those out, but even inverted, if you're flying on a on a fairly regular basis, um, you can um, operate the engine. Doesn't matter if it's right side up or upside down. We get great results with both applications. It's more about the plugs getting fouled. But if you're getting carbon buildup, it's probably not from the um, uh, engine being upside down. It's really how that engine is set up. It, it, carbon buildup comes from the fuel air oil mixture coming through that carburetor. The carburetor doesn't know the engine's right side up or upside down. 
and I was just going to cover something about cylinder honing. You know, if you're if you're in there and uh, you're starting to get excessive um, um, carbon buildup, it it actually um, gets on the sides of the cylinders. Um, let me show you a different picture here because this I think will will help. We looked at this picture once before, and this is carbon buildup that's on the bottom of a piston. Take a look at this here. That carbon buildup, there's actually more carbon buildup on the bottom of that piston than there is on the top of that piston. That carbon buildup is there because this engine is running high cylinder head temperatures with a petroleum-based oil, like a Pennzoil, um, and the temperatures are so hot on the piston that it's actually it's cooking. It's just like your skillet on your uh, on your stove. It's actually cooking the oil into the bottom of that. That will all of that oil that's getting cooked on there is talking about high CHTs, and that's why we have found that when we're operating some, an engine like a 447, for example, that typically runs a much hotter cylinder head temperature, uh, typically in the 375 degree range on cylinder head temperature we find that we get far less of this carbon buildup when we use the synthetic oils, which are much less susceptible to the burning and the flashing because the, the flash off point is such higher temperature with the synthetic oils than it is with the petroleum based oils. Where on the other hand, um, if we had an engine that was set up, well, here's an example of a 582 that's showing extreme detonation, but it's, it's showing detonation to the point where it actually split the, the piston on the inside and it's coming through now. The only hot spot, this is using Pennzoil, the only hot spot where we're actually getting um, solids built up from carbon deposits are from um, that spot where we actually have detonation in it, but it's on a 582. And so you can see the rest of the piston, because it's so cold, because it's a water-cooled engine, we don't ever get carbon buildup on a 582 anywhere near like we would on an air-cooled engine like a 503 or a 447. And so that's why when someone says, oh, well, I think Pennzoil is the greatest, well, I would probably agree with him if he was running a 582. But if he was running a 447, I would probably say, well, you may have to decarbon a little bit more frequently on your 447. So it, it's really about operating environment and, you know, what oil is, is better versus, you know, the whole, um, and, you know, these conditions, whether it's right side up or upside down, they're all related to setting up the engine. It doesn't have anything to do with it, its position. And with that, Brian, we're uh, already at 8.30 and uh, up against our, our time. And, I know. And, we uh, could go on forever. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, in fact, there are some questions left here on the board, uh, some very specific questions. If it's all right with you, I'll, I'll uh, just uh, forward those to you, and, and maybe you can follow up with the uh, individuals uh, on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, if that's all right. Um, yeah, let me let me just warn everybody ahead of time. We are extremely busy. Um, it's very very difficult for us to spend the time. Uh, all of my calls are screened by Carol, and um, we we really have to put our customers that have taken our classes at the head of the line. And so sometimes it's really hard for us to get these answered. If I get some spare time, I will certainly try and hit some of these things. But um, it's not that I don't want to answer your questions. It's just uh, it's a time constraint. To, in fact, uh, tomorrow morning we start another 120-hour class, and uh, you know it's uh, it's a little tough. So I, I, if you don't get your answers immediately, uh, get on our website and um, uh, get one of our repairmen with a maintenance rating. They're all over the country now. They're listed on RainbowAviation.com, and these guys are really helpful at answering these questions also, and that's really their job. They're out there doing this on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, give them a call and see if they can't help you out also. All right. Uh, any other final thoughts before we uh, close out this evening? Um, it's, it's just that uh, what I do want you guys all to leave with is that um, – you shouldn't be afraid of your two-stroke engine. Um, it is possible for you to operate these things correctly. Um, it's, it's really all a matter of choosing to really treat it as though everything is important. And if you really don't know about it, um, get somebody that does to help you get it set up. Once it's set up right, boy, it, it's just so easy to be successful with these things. And 
you know, the cost of them is reasonable enough that we need to have all the opportunities we can to get you guys in the air. And I think two strokes really have the the best advantage of doing that because we can get in the air without spending twenty five, thirty thousand dollars on an engine. And so uh, don't be afraid of them, but do you know take care of them properly and get them set up correctly. Sounds good. We, uh, again, appreciate you taking uh, time out of your, your busy schedule to uh, share some of your insights on the uh, two-stroke engines with us. Uh, Brian, we uh, really uh, really value being here tonight. And uh, if you're looking at your screen here, we've got uh, your website up, uh, Rainbow Aviation Services. Uh, folks, use that, uh, use that resource. It's there for, uh, for you, and uh, they're definitely uh, experts in the field. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up our uh, webinar for this evening. Again, uh, appreciate uh, all of you being here with us and uh, spending time. Uh, Aircraft Spruce and Specialty uh, is kind enough to help make these webinars possible, and we thank them for their support. Once we close out the uh, webinar, a short survey will pop up. We'll ask you to fill out uh, just a couple of questions so we can continue to uh, refine our, our webinar process. Again, thank you for being with us this evening. Have a great night. <laughs>